Now, your family, a very good-looking family at that, have overcome some massive barriers, not only in terms of uh, race and uh, sort of being a black and mixed-race family in perhaps uh, very traditional and white institutions, but also the financial aspect of things. And when you look at sort of um, trying to navigate and enter new spaces, it can often be very costly, especially with regard to classical music. Uh, could you perhaps just discuss how you overcame some financial barriers that has enabled all of your children to be taking up music to such a high level? I think that's probably why classical music is, is seen to be such uh, an exclusive area, um, because the instruments are expensive, the lessons are expensive, the travel to lessons are expensive, the travel to concerts and competitions, getting into concerts are expensive, the whole gamut. So when we went into, we have seven children, but of course we started with the one, um, and she was desperate to have lessons, so we thought, okay, that's fine. But unfortunately, if you give something to one child, you've got to give to all seven. And I think what parents, I think a good tip for parents is don't think about the whole thing at once. Just do it, take one day at a time. Because if you do, you'll realize you can't afford it. Okay. I hope you wrote that down. <laughs> don't take it all at once, all right? And that's really helpful. So that's sort of looking at uh, finances. But then uh, if we look at sort of the aspect of race, um, how you found uh, navigating these yeah. very different spaces to the space in which you grew up. And perhaps for the audience here, you could sort of share some insight on your upbringing, uh, just in case they're not aware of it, as it's discussed in this very great book <laughs> that you can get from all good retailers. <laughs> Thank you. <dear. laughs> Yeah, because I think when people talk about access to classical music, as an example, um, the first thing to be mentioned is finance, which is a huge barrier, but it's not just finance. There's a huge cultural barrier as well. I know when the children were growing up and they were starting to play their instruments, we had so many people coming up to us and saying, why are you pushing, especially our boys, into an area where they're only going to fail, wow. into an area where they don't belong, um, and we were accused of setting them up for failure. And I think that's a very difficult barrier to get through. And really, if um, there's a matter of self-confidence as well. Because I think every time we went into a concert, we were the only black people in the audience. There were no black musicians on stage. And so it seemed to be um, true that, in fact, this wasn't the space we belonged to. Yeah. And um, I was born in Sierra Leone. Um, to uh, an African father, Sierra Leonean father, and uh, a Welsh mother. So already there was a huge barrier that had been overcome with my parents. And I think that probably gave me the strength to think, you know what, you don't listen to what other people say. You can go anywhere you want. You can, um, I suppose, go against people's expectations. And my husband um, was the son of immigrant Antiguan parents who had to overcome going to try and buy a house and at the doorstep the owners wouldn't let them over the doorstep and pretended the house was sold and all those issues that they had to go through in the 50s and 60s. So I think both of us were brought up with that sense of defiance which was very helpful, I think. And, and would you say that you uh, were very decisive in passing that on to your children or they just picked up on that through their parents? I think it's interesting, and I don't know if this is the gender divide, but my husband was always completely defiant. He never took no for an answer. He wasn't interested. Whereas I wanted to gather my children to me and protect them, because I knew what the world was like. But I think between the two of us, we managed to forge a way through. I like that. Um, I, I really like the fact that you touch upon uh, your upbringing in Sierra Leone. And you're from quite a large family. Uh, if you could perhaps uh, let us know about your family in Sierra Leone. It's probably an understatement. So my father was one of 45 children. Uh, um, his father had um, 21 wives and his mother had 10 children. So I was brought up with lots and lots of cousins and aunties and uncles. So when we came to the UK, a big family was what I was used to. Um, my husband's mother is one of 12, his, his father's one of seven, so he grew up with lots of cousins. Um, so big family was what we understood, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, what's seven children, right? Nothing. 
That's, that's incredible. Um, and with regards sort of raising children, we've spoken at length about the logistics involved. Uh, I imagine you run your household like a military operation. And perhaps you could uh, just give us some insight into what it took to get the children to practice, to concerts. Yeah. I mean, you live in Nottingham. A lot of this is in London. Yeah. Uh, what time would you have to leave in the morning, for example? Um, what would you have to do to get them all to their various practices and recitals? Yes, yeah, so we made the very brave step of allowing them, uh, because Isata, our eldest, decided she wanted to study at the Junior Royal Academy of Music in London, which we thought, well, it's probably not going to happen because you have to have an audition, it's very difficult to get in. And then she got in. So um, eventually... But very we, quickly, how old was she when she said that she wanted to do this? She was nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we ended up at the height, I think, taking five children every Saturday to the Royal Academy. And then the other two are going there now. But um, yes, so it was a 6am train from Nottingham to London and a whole day in London and then back about half past eight at night. Wow. But um, just the logistics of getting all those children yeah. <laughs> into the car, to yeah. the train station, to London. But I think in some ways we were lucky having seven children because you have to, as parents, have a sense of routine. Otherwise you cannot survive bringing up that many children in a sane manner. So um, the practice was part of that routine. They'd come home from school, they would eat, they would do their homework, they would practice. And because they saw all their brothers and sisters doing the same thing, I think that made it easier in a way. Wow. Incredible. I'm, I'm not sure how you've done it. Still, I've read about it. I see you here, but I'm still not sure how you've done it. it it's really incredible. And so we've spoken about sort of financial aspects also the racial aspect of overcoming barriers, uh, as well as the logistics. Um, but with regard yourself as a parent, I mean, you were a great academic. Um, perhaps uh, you lost part of that identity in raising these seven children. So was there a barrier to overcome there as well? I think that's incredibly difficult for mothers. I do sympathize hugely because I had a career. I thought that I wasn't really going to have children, I was going to have an amazing career. And even if I had children, it wasn't going to affect it. That's not the reality, I think, of life in the UK. It's very difficult to afford childcare for a start. So when I stopped work, I thought it was temporary. And I thought I would just go back to my career. But two things happened. I think one is circumstance and practicality. It was very difficult for me to go back. And another was a huge loss of self-confidence. I think you become, you take on the identity of a mother, which is not a positive identity, I think. Um, and you stop thinking of yourself as an independent person who can go to work and be articulate. I mean, I was surrounded by children all day, talking children's language. And I thought, how on earth would I, you know, take off these clothes which are covered in baby vomit or whatever <laughs> and walk out into the world? I remember talking to a colleague of mine who had children and she said she used to feel that she was coming to work with an apron on because that's very, very much, I suppose, take on that identity internally. Yeah. So, yes, it was a huge, that was a huge sacrifice, yeah. actually. Wow. Um, it's really interesting to hear you say that. You touched upon confidence there. You mentioned yeah. self-confidence. You also mentioned self-confidence earlier with regard to the children and them sort of uh, pursuing their talents. Um, was that something that you inculcated into your children? And perhaps if you did, how? Mm. I found that very difficult because I think um, when we took them to music competitions or we took them to the Royal Academy, Isata, when she arrived at the Royal Academy, was the only black child in that institution. Things have changed a bit since then, but she was the only one. And it was very difficult to know what to do. So what I did was not to mention it, not to go on about it, obviously she noticed, but to act as though this was the most natural thing in the world. Obviously you can't do that all the time because things are going to happen. Um, and I think my husband did it by just total defiance. He wasn't interested in, in it being an unusual thing. And he just, as I said, take it day by day. Like that. There, there's a lesson in that for everyone here when you're navigating <laughs> new areas or going into a new space. Maybe not fake it till you make it, but just take it day like by that. day. <laughs> <laughs> but your husband was very defined. Yeah. He wasn't fake it. He was actually doing that. Um, I'd like to touch upon our second topic now. 
And that's what individuals and organizations can do to be more inclusive. Uh, you've spoken at length and also written about inclusivity. Uh, are there any sort of uh, key takeaways, especially for our audience here, largely a corporate audience, um, that they can take away and apply tomorrow to try and be a bit more inclusive with regard to uh, their organisation, but also how they interact with other people? Mm. I think this is actually a really difficult area, and it has so many different angles. Mm -hmm. um, if I could start with what a lot of orchestras are doing. Mm -hmm. um, when you audition for an orchestra, you go up in front of a panel and you play. And what they were finding is, was however much they tried, they were not getting orchestras more diverse. So what they introduced was blind auditions. So everybody went behind a screen and auditioned, and immediately the numbers of black and um, diverse people shot up. And so I think what it shows is that there is a kind of unconscious bias, obviously, that goes on. Um, so they would see a black person playing an instrument and immediately think, well, that person can't be as good as a white person playing an instrument. So that's one approach. Another approach I think that happens in companies is, is, is blind applications where you don't see the name, because the name, of course, is immediately a marker. Um, and I think it's the culture of institutions. Because there is a way in which if you enter, for example, a lot of classical music institutions, there's a very particular culture that goes with, th with that. Yeah. You have to talk in a certain way, behave in a certain way, um, and that needs to be worked on as well. So it's a constant dialogue, I think. And having people in high places in companies is extremely important because that immediately changes what you do as a company. Yeah, having people bought into those suggestions yeah. that you mentioned. Um, that's really, really helpful and some key takeaways for everyone here, I think. Very conscious of the time and uh, I'd like to ask for us to quickly touch upon nurturing creativity. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to be creative in some of these careers in the city. Uh, also, we spoke about this uh, yesterday on Zoom, people often throw creativity to the side and then they reach a certain age, especially after raising children, they think, oh, I used to play in a band or I used to like motorbikes so I'm going to get a Ducati now and I'm like you know 60 years old on my super bike what am I doing how would you uh, give perhaps uh, let me phrase this correctly how would you suggest people nurture creativity because you've done it so well with your family mm -hmm. what are some suggestions you could have for individuals in the audience to nurture creativity be it art music or whatever they're interested into. What specifically have you done that you could advise others to do? I think my bugbear is education. So um, I do find that state education has changed a lot so that you have the creative arts, so you have music, um, anything to do with the creative and performing arts is pushed aside and it's all about learning facts maths, English, and that's fantastic. But what I would say is there is not a gap between those things and that what's happened with the syllabus, and I noticed it when my daughter was in sixth form, this is my fourth child, and um, she was doing English A-level, and she wrote what I thought was a fantastic essay on Romeo and Juliet. It was very textual, it was very imaginative. She got a really low mark for it. So I phoned the school because I was interested, why did she get a low mark? And the teacher said, I'm really sorry, but she didn't use any semicolons. <laughs> and um, to, me that, to me, that was a metaphor for a lot of things that are happening in education. I think you have to approach every subject creatively, which means thinking imaginatively, which means um, understanding things in a, in, a, in a, I suppose, sideways way. And I don't think that you can just say, I'm a musician, I'm an artist, and then I'm someone who does maths and English. Yeah. Every subject is creative. So it does come from that educational level. And I think it's, it's about thinking outside the box and talking, and um, it's in everything you do. It's not necessarily, I'm going to go out now and, and, I don't know, make a piece of art and then go to work, and those two things are separate, yeah. because they're not. And just very quickly and finally, what, what next for you and your family? What's next on the horizon? We've got an incredibly busy concert schedule, that's the first thing. And as parents, it's choosing which child we're going to listen to tonight, because <laughs> their concerts are always clashing. Um, and constantly keeping up with it, because they are musicians, but they also feel that they have to be role models, they also feel that they have to inspire others coming up. So 
we all do all of those things all, all at the same time. And as I said, one day at a time, otherwise you would die of the stress. Yeah. <laughs>